This Human Capital Podcast is brought to you by Goalspan, a performance management app that helps you set goals, get real-time feedback, run reviews, and align your workforce around what's most important. With Goalspan, you can integrate with all your favorite HR and payroll apps. To learn more, go to goalspan.com. This is Jeff Hunt, CEO of Goalspan and host of Human Capital. Today, we're going to talk about both the financial and non-financial benefits of building diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, or DEIB as most people know it, into your organization's culture. The challenge for leaders is that there are many reasons it's difficult to implement, including resistance to change, unconscious bias, lack of awareness, a fear of retaliation, or even ineffective leadership. For leaders, this is clearly an uphill battle. After hearing this, you might even be asking, why would we want to take all of that on when we can barely get our jobs done every day? The reason is that there's now a large body of compelling research to help you understand how DEIB should be a core strategy. I'm going to share five studies that validate this. According to McKinsey, companies with more diverse leadership teams financially outperform their less diverse counterparts. A Boston Consulting Group study showed that on average, diverse teams produce 19% more revenue. Gallup concluded that companies with inclusive cultures experience 22% higher profitability and greater levels of employee engagement and productivity. Glassdoor found 67% of job seekers considered diversity an important factor when evaluating companies. And lastly, Sherm found inclusive workplaces have, on average, 39% lower turnover than their counterparts. All of this confirms that the business case for DEIB is a strategic advantage. Today, to help me unpack this complicated topic, I'm delighted to welcome Shan Cooper, the founder and CEO of Journey Forward Strategies. Shan's impressive background includes being the first Black woman to be VP and general manager of a division of Lockheed Martin overseeing 8,000 employees. She also served as the executive director for the Atlanta Committee for Progress and is the former chief transformation officer at Westrock. Shan has been recognized with numerous awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Atlanta Business Chronicle. And Shan currently serves on multiple boards of major corporations. Welcome, Shan. Thank you, Jeff. Delighted to be here with you. I'm so happy to jump into this conversation. And I think that based on our initial conversations before we hit the record button, it'll be a spirited and hopefully enlightening conversation. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Let's do it. <laughs> so before we talk about this topic at hand, I'd love to have our listeners get to know you a little bit. Can you start us out by sharing a a short thumbnail of your career journey. What did this look like for you? Oh, absolutely, Jeff. First, the first part of it was confusing and not real clear. <laughs> <laughs> I had the opportunity to join Lockheed Martin Corporation where I spent the bulk of my career, and it was just fantastic. Had a chance to work in human resources area, then transitioned to the operations as you spoke of. Went left there, went over to West Rock. So I left airplanes, as I like to say, planes, and went to paper, paper and packaging. <laughs> Uh, and then went to people, uh, as you talked about, Atlanta uh, Committee for Progress. And so I have I've had a very diverse career, uh, but I've enjoyed every moment of it. The, the key for me was being in roles that allowed me to have an impact uh, on the organization. So I've been very blessed in that regard. And who inspired you most along the way? Two responses to that question. First, of course, would be my parents. Uh, I was the first in my family to go to college. And uh, I was just determined that I was going to work hard and do my best uh, so that I could take care of them. And thankfully, that has worked out great. In terms of the company, I've always been blessed to have great mentors. And I can't talk enough about the value of having good mentors who tell, you know, who will give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I've been able to do that. But I'll call out one person, and that's Linda Gooden. Uh, Linda Gooden is still in my life today. She was a powerful force at Lockheed Martin when I was there. And really taught me, in many ways, the financial acumen that I need to have, having transitioned over from a human resources functional staff role to an operations role. But we often need those kinds of people. And so I'll give a shout out today to Linda Gooden, who's just awesome. I love that story. And, you know, it's people like Linda that can really change a person's life. And it's a reminder for me and hopefully all of our listeners to 
be actively engaged in either mentoring another person, if you have the skill sets to do that, or to seek out a mentor in your life, whether it's in business or elsewhere, right? Yes, we, and we all need it because we all have those blind spots, right? Parents tell us that we're perfect and we believe it, <laughs> but the reality is in the corporate world, we all, we all could use a little help. Absolutely. No question about it. Well, that's inspiring. And so going into this topic a little bit, Chan, there are so many political and societal issues fighting DEIB advancement. The number of job postings for chief diversity officers dropped by 48% in 2023. And more than 40 lawsuits have been filed by activist law firms against minority hiring or venture investment programs. I'm just curious about what factors you think are contributing to all of this. Well, Jeff, unfortunately, I think uh, when you think about the world of DEI, I think we have lost the connection between why DEI happened in the first place. DEI was work that was needed to actually create value for organizations. And what's happened is, unfortunately, it's become politicized in society. And so companies, uh, unfortunately, corporations find themselves in a position where they're now having to get involved in these societal issues. That wasn't the case, you know, years ago, right? It was just deliver the product to your customers, make your money, you know, support, you know, give back to your shareholders and continue creating value. And so what we've done is we have lost the connection between DEI and value creation. We have also became, you know, defined DEI very small, very small parameters. It is representation. So when I work in that space, I will tell you, we didn't use diversity as terminology. Well, what we were talking about was representation. Mm. Now you can't have talk about diversity and not talk about representation, right? That's absolutely true. So you can't hide, you can't get away from that. But what it should, what it should be more about is understanding that we have a culture and environment where regardless to how you're packaged, right, you can come here and help us create value for our shareholders and for the clients. And so because we lost that connection, people now see it as I win and you lose. You know, as a black woman, I you win, you lose as, as a white, you know, male. And that's, that was never the intention of the work. And so that's why the, the, the statistics that you talked about in your opening of all this research that shows how powerful and, and value creating it can be, but we've gotten the stories misaligned. And I think that's what's happening. And I'm sad to hear actually that statistic, because I think now given all the change that's happening in, within organizations, right? All that's happening, all that's been driven by COVID and things beyond that, we need these roles now more than ever to help us understand the employee experience. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I, I would just say we've got this misalignment that's happened. That makes sense. Really connecting the dots to the value, uh, mm -hmm. because that's such a compelling reason that the value's there, uh, you would do it. And I'm wondering if that disconnection to value is also some of the reasons why we're seeing something in, in the whole DEI space that's similar to what we see in ESG, or for those listeners that are not familiar with, you know, environmental, mm -hmm. social, and governance issues where it's called greenwashing. So we have this situation going on where companies will check the box on some of these strategies, but they're not truly um, transformative in the organization. They're just more of a mirage for shareholders or vendors or, or customers. And is, are you seeing similar things in the DEI space as a result? Yes, I think, you, I think you've nailed something there, Jeff. And again, it's because we haven't Again, we haven't made that like we haven't aligned on those things. And because we're not, we're being so driven by external influences, right? To your point, we just, we just want to check the box so we're not called out. We don't want our company called out on anything, right? So we have to check the box. Yes, we, we've done it. We've done that. But the work of DEI, because it involves people, it's hard work. Very. And because you really have to understand what's important to me as an employee, what's important to you as an employee and others, right? Again, go back to the employee experience, right? And always remembering that when we come to the workplace, we bring a lot with us. I grew up in South, in the South. I grew up in Alabama in the Bible Belt, right? My dad's a pastor. I bring some of that to the workplace, right? You may have a different experience. There's someone in the team that may have come from New York or California. And so we bring all of our lives experiences to the workplace. And so those things can't be ignored, but somehow we get to have to get to a common language, right? And be able to talk about these differences, but talk about how we leverage them again to create value. Mm -hmm. And it can't be the check the box exercise because guess what? People know that when you do that. Yeah. 
And they know you're serious or not. Absolutely. And really, another way of what you're saying, it sounds like, is really that these different experiences that are brought from different parts of the country or the world or the sort of family of origin where we all come from are additive. They're not diminutive, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. that's how you have to see it, right? And you have to create space for that, honor that, respect that. But then have a real, real clarity around around why this work is important. Mm -hmm. You know what it means to us as a company, and you know oftentimes we make assumptions, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a women's uh, affinity group at Lockheed Martin, right? And what we heard from women was, you know, gosh, work life balance is important. Our culture at the time was around heroics, right? So if you didn't work sixteen hours a day, Jeff, you know what? And you weren't working enough, right? And so oh. yes, clearly you're not a real team player, right? But the reality is not only what we heard was that not only was work-life balance or at least, and I would say work-life integration, but not only was that important to the women in the organization, it was important to the men in the organization. Because guess what? They too were experiencing elder care issues. Right. They wanted to be at their, their kids, sporting events, what have you. So we had to step back, look at the culture and what experience we were creating from. Because were we really rewarding those employees who, who were at the office, 16 hours, not necessarily that they were working, right? Right. Well, still that old mindset, if I saw your car in the parking lot, I felt you were more committed. We had to check ourselves on that. And so it's it's so many things that organizations have to look at. And it takes time, right, and effort and commitment and investment to do these things. But it's even though those small things that we make assumptions about, that we have to check our assumptions too as well. Absolutely. It feels like so many of these things are like flexing a muscle. You have to really work that muscle continuously or it's going to atrophy. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When you think about moving the DEI agenda out of HR and into business and operational aspects and of the company, what are the ways that we can do that? Right. Well, first of all, is really, you know, it, it, and if it sits in HR, I mean, it sits outside of HR. So I was part of the HR organization, but I reported to the CEO. So reporting structure matters, right? Sure. What's important gets attention. And people know, right, that if it's going to be important or not. So where it sits in the organization is really, really important. And then the person who's leading that inside the organization really has to understand the business. And so you can't create the business case for the work if you don't understand the business. And that's why what I mentioned a little bit earlier, because I really wanted to understand how do we make money in this company? Because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to in many cases. And so understanding the business and how it operates, then I could say, take a step back and really begin to say, okay, how can this work of DA&I contribute again to value creation? So it's all from my perspective in that regard, it was about people. It was about a talent pipeline. It was, and, and, and the primary reason for me was, and for the leadership team was that, you know, here we were an organization that thrived off of having scientists, and engineers, and right. physicists, right? Because it really is rocket science and Lockheed Barton. And, but as we noticed that we were building the pipeline of the future, many of our young people weren't studying math and science, right? So that became a real clear alignment with our ability to deliver to our customers, right? We had to have the right talent to be able to do that. And so what were we going to do as a company, to not only just build a talent pipeline with a STEM pipeline for us, but for the country is how we saw it. So the mission and the purpose was big for us, but we knew the benefit would be great uh, for us if we could really begin to look at this. And that was where our discussions around diversity and equity and inclusion, that, that was where it would begin. We saw a real clear alignment, as I talked about earlier, with why we need to do this work. Not only did we talk about the pipeline, but we also wanted to keep our current talent. You know, we were known in the industry for developing great leaders and great talent. So people would often come and try to get our people, right? So we had to have an environment that would, that would keep the current talent. And so it was working both ends of that spectrum, but understanding we're not going to be able to deliver to our customers, meet our commitments, if we don't have the right talent in the organization. And that's why I challenge companies, before you even start down this diversity journey, to really be clear about why you are doing this why are you doing this, right? And then we could take a step back and say, well, who's studying? Who needs to be where? And so that's the beginning of the, found, of the foundation of our work, really being clear about why we need to do this work and then having the right people. The other thing we had to do um, was we had to be trained on it. So we could develop a common language. And so there was a lot of training that happened around DE&I, right? And it gave people an opportunity to voice their perspective on 
Hmm. And it wasn't always positive messaging that we received, but people knew that in the company, they could say, I'm not comfortable with this, or I don't understand this, or why are you guys trying to social engineer, right? Things, right? But it gave us a chance to talk about it. And that's what companies have to be willing to do. You can't manage diversity in this work via memo and talk about this. Mm -hmm. For sure. There's a couple of things I'm reflecting on, Shan, that you just shared that seem to be really important especially for people that are in positions of leadership and influence that are listening. One of them is truly understanding the business model. Because if you look at implementing these types of strategies, it almost always circles back to the CFO role. The CFO is going to want to know, what is the financial case for what we are doing? And if we can, that sort of supersedes everything. If we can nail that, then we can yes. move on to actually developing those strategies and implementing them. So that's one of the things I was reflecting on. The other one is that what you said in a number of different ways is that it's critical to actually be able to understand why this story is important and how to tell the story internally. So that being done through training, through communications, through connecting the dots for employees about why are we even spending all the time on this so that they can truly understand that it's outcome driven, it's results driven, it's, and it, yeah. it's going to positively impact them, not negatively impact them. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely, it does. And when you look at when you understand your business, so for a business like Lockheed Martin, our customer cycles for our products were for decades long, right? So you're not going to, you're not selling a product that you're going to sell in a week and deliver in a week. It's, you know, sometimes those things you deliver over years of time, right? And that's why that continuity and talent is so important. That's why the training is, why the training is so important. So understanding your business model is going to also help you shape how you talk about it and how you address what's happening in the environment. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, I'm, and Jeff, I'll be the first to say that we didn't always get it right. Uh, people will often point to and talk about the shooting that we had within Lockheed Martin, right? Right. Uh, where the shooter, uh, as best as we understood, the shooting was race driven. Mm -hmm. And this person didn't want to be uh, trained around diversity and inclusion, right? And in that, you really have to have an environment, right, where people can voice their discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'd have to address that kind of behavior to head on. Mm -hmm. And so you, you got to call it out, you got to name it, right? And just say, this is not the workplace we're going to be. And you can bring yourself, remember that person probably, you know, grew up in Mississippi, probably had some historical perspective on race. Uh, but again, you can't allow that kind of thing to linger in the workforce. And when you see it and you hear it, you got to call it out and address it and they deal with it. Mm -hmm. For sure. But I tell you what, that, that incident opened our eyes though. Uh, it opened our eyes and said, you know, no, 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 we, 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 got to get this right. And we got to ensure that everybody's playing. We got to ensure that people are trained to know how to even call that out mm -hmm. and what to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes these, the, the most difficult circumstances and events and traumas are what are the catalyst for true change, correct? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And there was nothing worse. I tell you that when people talk to me about my career, I will tell you being a part of the team that had to reopen that facility. And being a team lead for the work, uh, it was the worst day of my career. You know, what, probably one of the toughest things I've ever had to do, particularly, you know, having to tell a family with a parent's not coming home today. And so it gave me a greater sense of accountability and responsibility for the work. But I don't want companies to let get to that. It's right. going to be real mindful when you start to do the work, that it's hard work because you're dealing with humans, right? That have different perspectives, different values, right. different upbringings and all of that. And you got to make space for all of it, mm. but then move forward, right? To where you really need the company to be. Right. Absolutely. So before I ask this next question, I want to set the table for it a little bit. Race and race relations are difficult topics to discuss in general, and they sometimes feel even more difficult to discuss at work. So people typically avoid them. It seems like there's an opportunity to improve engagement if we are able to have healthy conversations around racial and ethnic differences. And I'm coming at this uh, question from the perspective of being an older white male, so I have to actually put that out there. And I'm asking, 
you, Shan, to only share of your experience, which may not be that of some of our listeners. And my question is, why is the topic of our racial differences so difficult to discuss in the workplace? And what can we do about this? Right. And Jeff, that is a powerful question. And I hope your listeners will continue to have discussions beyond our discussion today. I think there's a fear, right? There's a fear that if I say the wrong thing, I'm going to get in trouble. If I say the wrong thing, I'm going to be fired um, or I'm going to be sued, right? Nobody wants a lawsuit, right? So there's this fear about how do I talk about it, right? And my belief is that we get stuck around the word and the terminology and the work of diversity because we haven't dealt with the topic of race, right? And so I like to encourage people to talk about it in the context of history, not the history that we want to make up, right, or think that we have, but true history, true history. Because I think understanding history helps us shape our collective future. And so if I can create a safe space, right, uh, in the workplace where we can talk about it, and we, and we tried to do, and we did this, where we can talk about it and really ask questions. Because sometimes people are just curious. Mm-hmm. And when people ask questions, uh, I know sometimes it's hard not to be offended, right? But I ask people, like, give people grace because people are coming, fa- coming from a place of inquiry, inquiry in most cases, and not judgment, right? But if you can't ask a question to understand anything else we want to know, any other new knowledge, right? We ask questions, right? Yeah. But if you do that in the workplace without it being a safe space, we're never going to move forward around the topic of race. And so I love the fact when you can have a conversation around anything. One of the questions you'll ask about this, Jeff, one of the questions I got with Shan, uh, we would have these safe space conversations, right? With Shan, you know, how is it that Black women's hair can grow overnight? You know, what is that all about, right? Mm-hmm. And so I had to talk about, you know, the hair is a crown and glory, you know, in the Black and in the Black race. And, you know, it's a, it's, it, you know, it represents, represents who you are. And so, yes, I may have longer day. I may have shorter tomorrow, but it's an expression, right, mm-hmm. of who you are. Mm-hmm. And people should be able to ask that question. What's this thing about weave? Right? And, and, and it sounds silly, but when people are curious about that, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, let, let's ask, let's put them in a safe place. ask those questions, right? Right. And I think that is, and it gets back to culture, though, Jeff. It gets back to the environment that we're creating where people can have those conversations, again, in a safe place. Mm-hmm. But right now, everybody's fearful. Mm-hmm. You know, we think we don't want to be seen as you know, get caught up in the politics. We don't want to be seen a certain way. But there's a lot of curiosity out there. And so I try to ground in this initial discussions. And let's talk about history. Let's talk about the history of our country, the history of our state. And let's talk about that. And then talk about where we're going to be in the future. But we don't want to go back to that, right? And doing that in a way that we are emotionally intelligent, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) But inviting those conversations. But we have to have that safe space. Otherwise, we're never going to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I'll spend my tenure confused and not understanding. You'll spend your tenure confused and not understanding. And we're just not talking about it. Whereas it would be a much more powerful team if we just got it on the table so we could spend our energies on what value creation. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a thoughtful response <laughs> to a difficult question. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And it just sounds like that the, the main takeaways from that is we really need to season our conversations with grace and allow people to inquire without sh- shame and judgment, but an opportunity for connection. We also need yeah. to have leaders be able to create cultures where there is an opportunity for open conversation that is a safe, a safe opportunity for open conversations. Very much appreciate that. As you look at your experience at Lockheed Martin, and this is shifting gears a little bit, you had the opportunity, Shan, to engage with and to learn about many different cultures around the world just because of the nature of that business you were in. And I'm curious what you learned most from that experience. Oh my God, just an incredible, incredible jury. You can imagine growing up in small in a small town in Alabama, there was not much diversity, right? Or my, not much of a world view. Mm-hmm. But uh, I had the opportunity to your point to, to be in an organization where we were in 72 countries around the world. I had an opportunity to travel to these countries. And it was always enlightening for me, but I'll give you a real specific example, Jeff. So when I stepped over to 
be the VP and general manager in aeronautics, you know, delivering military aircraft around the world to our airlines. I actually hired a protocol officer. Mm. And people thought that was, what are you doing? That's nuts, right? But I wanted to have someone that would tell me, okay, here's the country that's coming in to receive their aircraft. Shan, here are the colors you can wear or you can't wear, right? Here's when you can and cannot extend your hand in greeting. And so having someone that made sure that I was culturally sound, right, as I did my job was really important. And she was so helpful to me. So when my customers came into the country, I knew exactly what I needed to do to really honor them, right? And that's why I say, you know, just being open-minded around this. And so I learned a lot, Mm. uh, particularly in that role around various cultures, but it was intentional, right? I wanted to get this right. I did not want to start an international incident, Jeff. (laughs) And so as a woman, the first woman in that role, right? Uh, I'm certain my customers, when they were coming up, they weren't expecting to see a woman delivering, you know, an F-22 or a C-130, right? Right, right. And I had Middle Eastern customers, right? Mm-hmm. They had a worldview about women in their countries, and I didn't want to disrespect that. But what was more more wonderful for me is that they understood our culture as well. And so I was easily accepted. Sure. I still followed the cultural norms, right? Particularly around the handshaking and when I could extend or when I could touch them or not. Mm-hmm. but we were just equally respectful. And guess what? We got business done. Mm-hmm. And so I learned a lot working in a company like Lockheed Martin. It was important to me. And so I studied cultures, have a degree in religions, right? And oftentimes it's, it is religion, right, that separates us. Mm-hmm. And so it was important to me that I understand the, the, the different cultures. And it was fascinating. Mm-hmm. I just enjoyed it, enjoyed it a lot. That's such a great testimony for our listeners because there were a few things that you did that were real, that I think very much key into the success of that. One was the recognition that I don't have it all figured out. I don't necessarily, I don't have the competency to know what to do in a specific situation. So I'm actually going to hire somebody to help guide me in that rather than make an assumption or yes. be a little bit egotistical in it and thinking that other people will adapt to me. So I really value and appreciate that. And it requires some investment and time and effort to make mm-hmm. that happen. But it, it sounds like you achieved a successful outcome as a result of doing that. And Jeff, I absolutely did. Like I said, and Pauline was fantastic. And I just were able, I was able to retain uh, our key customers and mm-hmm. continue to further build those relationships because mm-hmm. uh, the company really did take a chance in many ways, right? Of putting me, giving me the opportunity for that role. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to make sure I got it right. And, and I love it that, you know, your point too, I hadn't thought about it that way, but sometimes we do get to be pretty egotistical, right? Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> it. It's that's easy it. to yeah. do, right? When yes. you're in a leadership role mm-hmm. and you got the big title and the big job, what have you. But I'm, I've always been one, a leader who understood my limitations. Mm-hmm. Okay. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. At the end of the day, it's always been, I keep the end game in mind, right? The mission in mind. Yeah. The mission here is to deliver to our customers and to our shareholders, right? While taking care of our people. So my mantra was always mission first, people always. Mm-hmm. It was about taking care of my people. Yeah. Take mm-hmm. care of the team. Love that mission. Yeah. So when I think about the most important leadership competency, one of the things that rises to the top to the top is change management. And I'm also connecting the dots between a lot of the things that we've discussed around DEI initiatives and, and creating cultural change internally and embedding these things into our organizations. And I'm wondering, I know that you're highly competent in this area, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about the importance of change management as a leadership competency in an organization's ability to achieve not only these more micro issues, but also macro uh, yes. in achieving its overall vision and strategic objectives. Right. And, and Jeff, I'll tell you, that is absolutely critical. And I think as I'm working and seeing other companies, even for the boards I sit on, it's becoming more and more important uh, of a leadership capability. Uh, and so what I think about change management being, you know, the first thing, what you're really trying to do is change the mindset and behaviors, right, of the team. And that doesn't, it's not easy. No. But the tool, that I've, I've used two processes. One is the, the, just a simple process where 
first ensuring that people understand why we have to change. So we often say people resist change. I disagree with that. I say mm. people often get confused about the change because we as leaders don't take the time to explain the why of the change. Sometimes people just don't know how to change because we haven't explained that either. Nor have we thought about training them, right, in terms of how, the, what we need them to do. Sometimes they resist because they don't understand the incentive, about, the incentive for, for changing, right? They don't understand the business, the actual core business implication around that. And most okay. times people don't change because they don't see role models change because we don't change as leaders, right? We put the, here's a mandate, you need to do this differently, whatever, but we don't operate in a way that causes people to change, right? And so I think those four areas. So we can find a way to get people to understand and have their own personal ownership of the change, right? And that means as a leader, what you have to talk about it over and over and over. And the messaging becomes critical, but then you've got to start as a leader changing the processes in the organization that supports the change they want to see. The structure sometimes has to change. So you're reinforcing, right? We're changing and I'm changing all these processes and systems, right? so that it facilitates the change, right? But I'm going to, before I hold you accountable to the train, what I want to invest in you, I'm going to train you so you know exactly what I need you to do. And then you're going to see me behave differently as a leader as well. My questions are going to be different. Uh, how I engage with you is going to be different. And so, but what happens is we get so caught up in knowing where we've got to go as leaders, we assume that people know why we're doing it. Uh, I can remember working with one leader and I and said to him, well, what change management model do we use? And he looked at me and said, a change management model? He said, no, we tell them to change and they just do it. Well, you know that that never happens. That yeah. doesn't even happen about children, right? Come on, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. So and so I knew then I was going to have a hard, hard job, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... If we can take the time to do those, just four, there are five things, four things, right? Then people, then you'll get to people's mindset. And once you've got my mindset where I understand, yep, I understand this. I can own this with you. Then I'm willing to change my behaviors. And so, but people, leaders, it's, it's work to do that, right? It's time to do that. And because oftentimes as leaders, we don't have the time, right? We're running. We've got so many people we've got to answer to, right? But when you and you have to always own it, you can't delegate this as a leader, right? But what you've got to have is complete alignment with your leadership team, because that's the help that you can have to help you do that. And I had to learn that the hard way that I didn't have to be up all the time. I didn't have to be facilitating discussion all the time. I had a leadership team there, right? But we had to make certain that we were absolutely aligned. And I would tell you, a lot of the transformations that companies are talking about today, they fail because of the lack of leadership alignment. Mm. Okay, you ready for some lightning round questions? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> the first one, Shan, is what are you most grateful for? Oh, I'm grateful for my family. They just mean the world to me, I tell you. I live my life, faith, family, and then career. Uh, and that's what I believe in. And uh, they're, they're just my life. They're it. They're it for me. What's the most difficult leadership lesson you've learned over your career? Oh, my God, the ability to listen. <laughs> and to recognize that as a leader, I'm not going to, I may have the title, but I won't always have the answers. So we got to listen. Decisions at the lowest level of impact. Who is one person you would interview if you could, living or not? Living would be Michelle Obama. I just think she's just fantastic. Uh, I've been mistaken for her several times, which is not true. But anyway, it's, it, people think that. Uh, and then, you know, not a lot. Of, one of my heroes growing up in corporate America was Colin Powell. And I know people would expect me to say Jesus because my dad's a pastor. I would say Colin Powell. Uh, <laughs> and I use a lot of my, one of, the, one of the things that he helped me with was understanding that in, in a leadership role, you're not always going to have the data that you need to make decisions. But if you've got 70% plus your gut, make the call. Mm -hmm. That sounds like strong leadership to me. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. Do you have a top book recommendation for our listeners? You know, I'm reading, I, I'm reading uh, two right now. I'm reading CEO Excellence. And I forget who it's by, but it's a great, great book. And then I just recently, well, just wrapping up a book called Remarkable by David Sawyers. And I love that book. It's another culture perspective, but I love it. Those are two that I would recommend. Well, I really appreciate that because I interviewed David Sawyers on my podcast and we discussed his book. So if you're listening to this and you want more information about the book or you want a sneak peek, then go back and listen to that episode with David. So yeah, really Please do. He's that. awesome. He's <laughs> he awesome. Is. Love he, is, yes. he is amazing. Now, have you, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Um, 
asking smart questions, the ability to ask smart questions. To because you can't get people, you can't tell people what's in a leadership role, but sometimes you have to be able to ask smart questions to get them to discover where you need them to go. But in the process, you often learn as well. Mm-hmm. But if you can ask smart questions and listen for the answer, you get to better decisions, I think, as a leader. So love that. That was my number one teaching. Yeah, number one, mm-hmm. number one. Best Curiosity thing. is a superpower, isn't it? Yes, it is. It really is. It really is. <laughs> well, Shan, I've really loved our conversation and you've given us so much to think about. And I'm curious from you, speaking of curiosity, what would you say is the most important one or two takeaways that you want to leave our listeners with today? Yeah, I'll just say this. You know, I, I say, you know, mission first, people always. And just understand the mission, whatever your mission may be in, for your organization, it will not work or become evident without your people. So just take care of your people, people always, right? Just take care of your people and they will take care of you, your customers and your shareholders. Mm. Shan, thank you again for such a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Jeff. I've had a great time. Thanks for including me. Thanks for listening to Human Capital. If you like this show, please tell your friends and also take the time to go rate and review us. Human Capital is a production of Goalspan, your integrated source for performance management. Now go out and be the inspiration to other humans. And thank you for being human, kind.